Hello everyone. Uh, welcome to a little informal little Q&A with myself, uh, Simon from the Loki Project and Sam from the Yarweave team. Hi. And uh, yeah, we're here today to answer a few community questions that we had posted. Uh, we're here in kind of dreary looking Hong Kong at a conference called T Token 2049, which has been a pretty decent experience. Um, we've got the lovely central behind us. We're on the Kowloon side of the harbour at the moment and um, outside the Kerry Hotel. So, yeah, I guess we'll... Uh, well, why don't we start with a, a, a very quick explainer of what the Arweave project is. Yeah, sure. So Arweave is essentially a permanent information storage system on which lives a kind of what we're calling a perma web. So a web that you can access through a web browser um, but everything on, inside it is permanent and immutable and cryptographically verifiable. So you just simply never get a 404 page. Sweet. Um, for those that don't know, uh, Loki is, among other things, uh, I think particularly relevant to this conversation is uh, we're building a new onion routing network that uses the blockchain to regulate the nodes that are running those relays. So um, the collaboration between Arweave and Loki has come about over us meeting each other. When did we meet? I, Around a year ago now. Yeah, it must have been a year ago uh, in, Berlin, in Berlin, about two weeks, two weeks from now, a year ago. Something like sense. that, 50 weeks. Yeah. So we came straight from this exact conference last year, <laughs> flew to Berlin to go to the Zero Knowledge Summit, and I think that's where we met, so. Yeah, it was the um, Monkey X thing after that as well. That's correct, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that was the second time around. You remember anyway. in September? So we've met a number of times uh, between uh, the last year, I, I guess, and we've been staying in touch. And uh, in it was in con at consensus that we came up with the idea for Silo, which is a way that I can give someone simply uh, uh, a word and a number and that w is all the information they need to anonymously access undeletable information. Um, is the way I would like to summarize it. Um, yeah, I mean, from our end, it's like just a privacy layer on top of the perma web. Yeah. So you can use it in the same way that you would HTTPS, that kind of thing. Yeah, but it uses, um, using this uh, secret word and number, uh, you can have an encrypted piece of information permanently stored on the R-Weave that is only knowable through guessing uh, this name. It's, it's kind of like a password. It's hashed multiple times. Yeah, it's it's like a mixture between a password and a domain name, I guess. Yeah, I guess you'd yeah. call it that. And it, um, it, the critical thing is that everyone that has this name can access the data. But yeah. other than that, it's, it's completely invisible, essentially. So how it works is, is let's say, the, the number we used when we were devising this system was bubble.7. I don't know why. It's just what we chose. And. Uh, Essentially how it works is if I walk up to you in the park and I say uh, bubble.7 and then I walk in the other direction, that's the only exchange of information that we need. We don't need to write anything down. We don't need to hand over sketchy encrypted USBs with passwords and, and that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, so uh, what I would then do with bubble.7 is I would go to the silo interface and I would type in bubble.7 and then what happens in the back end is bubble.7 is hashed uh, what is it? Two to the power of seven times. Two to the power of seven times because it's dot seven, that's right. Um, and then the result of that is split up into two parts. One is an identifier that I can use to look at the R-Weave and go, I would like this transaction on the R-Weave. Um, and the other is an, uh, essentially a password for that file because that file is uploaded in encrypted form using the second half of that key. And then you can unlock it and view it. Um, and it's, but the critical thing is that you transfer the key uh, rather you keep the keys safe mm. and you transfer the ID to the network and so the person that's serving you the transaction associated with the ID doesn't ever have access to the key yeah. and as a consequence they, they can't work out what the data is doing. And where does Loki fit into all this? Uh, during Throughout this whole process um, whenever up the, the uploading is occurring or whenever the, the transaction Querying is being fetching, pulled down yeah. That all happens through LokiNet, which uh, greatly increases the security of the access. So the node, the Arweave node doesn't know um, your IP address, um, whether or not you're uploading it or pulling it down, because that's metadata that could be harvested to figure out what is going on if you were under scrutiny for whatever reason. So um, yeah, that's kind of a summary of what Silo is. Um, Development-wise, Silo already exists on the Arweave web web extension, um, and on our end, we are 
sort of halfway through developing a gateway to be able to access it uh, using the Loki testnet at the moment. Um, so I think you guys already have like a, a it's crude. gateway inside Loki. And That's I right. I think we've, we've almost tried it start to finish. Yeah. But uh, yeah, because it's testnet, it's kind of sketchy. It is, it is a bit sketchy, but <laughs> it's getting there in the end. And yeah. um, so yeah, that, that's the, the Aweave Loki silo partnership. Um, and over the coming you know, months as LokiNet evolves, um, the user experience through that will get better. We'll probably design a, a gateway to make this really seamless for anyone that's interested in using this uh, service. Um, but I guess we'll get into the rest of the questions yeah. now. That I mean, I think the one thing we didn't cover that's really nice about it is that you, you have this address and you just put it into the URL bar of your browser, just yeah. like normal. So it, it feels very much like just accessing a normal web page from the point of view of the user. Mm -hmm. You just say web plus silo colon stroke stroke bubble dot seven and boom, you're there. Yeah. It's neat. And um, we also, I guess, didn't discuss the um, uh, the resistance that the, the hashing two to the power n times gives you. Oh, yeah. We, yeah. Well, that yeah. the reason why we did that is so... Uh, it's rainbow tables. Rainbow basically. tables. So rainbow table attacks, for those that don't know, is uh, essentially where you take a hashing function and then you grab a dictionary of words and you just basically produce the result for all of those words and then you have they already exist for almost all hashing algorithms. yeah so you can have um, a database that can tell you a very large number of results for any given hash without you having to actually uh, go and guess it or brute force the the hashing so what you don't want is to have just bubble because Bubble's going to be very easily discovered, and then once you've discovered the hash result of Bubble, and you try and look at that on the R wave, not only can you find if it exists or not, but if it does, you can unlock it as well. So we wanted to make it a lot harder uh, for an external attacker to guess uh, the result of a hash and find something that the user wouldn't want them to. So. Um, and so it, it has exponential difficulty as well. So basically, the more security you want to give to your site, the higher that number should be. Yeah. It's kind of similar to proof of work. In fact, the first version we came up with literally was a proof of work. You yeah. were trying to find the first collision um, that had uh, some number of zeros at the front. Mm -hmm. And we realized actually you can just get rid of that part and just do two to the power n and it's the same kind of thing. Yeah. But what's really nice about this is that it makes it secure for like a very long time to come. You just keep increasing that number as the uh, power that computers can give you increases over time. Even two to the power of seven, the example that we gave is like already. It's it, good enough for now, but like, yeah, I think two to the power of fifteen is probably a good place to start. Or you could even do two to the power of a hundred if you are really keen, but you might really? be sitting there for a while. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and as like as computers get better, people just scale that number, and the protocol doesn't need to change it. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, let's get into the, the yeah, um, let's do it. The community questions. Could you elaborate a bit more on Blink? Uh, okay, well, very quickly, Blink is a Loki feature that will allow people to send transactions with a very high probability of confirmation in under five seconds. Um, where it's at at the moment, uh, we did some research over the last six months, but to be frank, it just really hasn't been very high on our priority list. We think that the primary uh, products of Loki are LokiNet and the Loki Messenger, so almost all of our resourcing has gone into that. The work we have done on Core has been focused around making staking a more enjoyable experience. Um, but that's only because we are focused on the Messenger and LokiNet, because if staking is difficult and it's unstable and insecure, then maintaining a high quality network is gonna be very difficult. So um, we haven't really been focusing on Blink just yet. Uh, it is on the roadmap. We are probably gonna have it done by the end of the year. Uh, but it's a cool feature that really brings out the currency use case for Loki, um, amongst other things. Yeah, what's so, the mechanism behind that? Uh, so how it works is you get uh, a quorum of uh, service nodes that selected each, each block or each group of blocks. Uh, and basically, uh, you can spend extra money uh, to propagate transactions to that quorum. And essentially, you're just telling the network, okay, if this group of service node generally agrees that this transaction is going we'll to be included yeah, into okay. a block, then we will nice. accept it. Yeah. So it, it, it's very simple, yeah, um, cool. but it just means that you don't have to wait for something to enter a block before it goes in. Because once it enters a block uh, it, and there is a reorganization, it still sits within the quorum. So it means it, it will be included at some later point if there is a reorganization. So what about if there's 
a reorg and then there's another transaction. That goes in? Yeah. Uh, well, you just refer to the next quorum. Okay, Dash has been doing this for ages now using yeah. instant send. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's not a new idea, we're just basically copying it. This. <laughs> but yeah, it's a good idea, like why wouldn't you? Um, open source networks. Exactly right, open source development. Um, yeah. uh, okay, how will the silo partnership benefit Loki token holders? Well, we don't know yet. Um, I guess uh, the more stuff we can get used on Loki net and the, you know, I, I imagine there'll be some uh, Cross interest between our both our user bases for various different reasons. So, you know, doing partnerships like this and collaborating with um, other projects, as we both know, is uh, something that is definitely worthwhile doing because it allows you to build that user base. And from having a large user base comes with it network growth, and that's I think going to be the main determining factor in what brings value to the Loki network overall. Yeah, I mean, at this stage, I think we're we're trying to build the infrastructure for a decentralized web mm. in general. Um, what people use that for eventually is like an open question, but getting the groundwork in place is really important. And here there was a very obvious crossover in what we were doing, so mm. it's nice to be able to join it up. Yeah. yeah. Alright, next question. If these two merged, would it be possible to create a decentralized VPN with storage? That's exactly what it is basically, except slightly better. It's not just a VPN, it's, mm. a, it's a, well, not quite a mixed net, but pretty close. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It, it's, it's an onion routing network. It is. There's been this concept of a decentralized VPN floating around now for a few months. I've seen some projects say that they are doing a decentralized VPN, but you really don't want to use a decentralized VPN. Because yeah. what that implies is that it is a single node that you are trust completely trusting with your internet connaction. They can and see everything. Random, which is like, yeah, it's well, crazy. They can see everything you're yeah. doing. Um, and you don't know how to contact them. They're not a uh, for-profit, well, they might be for-profit, but there's really no requirement for them to pander to your needs specifically. You're much better off using a centralized VPN service because at least then there is some recourse and if something bad happens. trust to someone that you actually trust yeah. rather than assigning it to a network of random people, essentially. Yeah, you're, yeah. you're just, you're eliminating the only uh, thing required to be able to use it for VPN, which is trust, you now can't trust anyone and you're going to use it anyway. It's, yeah. it's ridiculous. So I think the only workable decentralized VPN essentially is like an onion routing network of some kind. Definitely. It's basically the direct replacement. Yeah, because it, in order for a decentralized VPN thing type of thing to exist, you have to eliminate the, the requirement for trust. So that's exactly what happens in onion routing. You don't have to trust anyone in the if you select them randomly and you get to select who they are, you don't have to trust any one of those nodes because they don't, they're not able to build a complete picture of your internet connection. The exit node can see what you're looking at. The guard node knows which other two nodes you're, uh, sorry, not the guard node, the middle node knows the other two, and then the front one knows who you are and the next node. But so long as you uh, are confident that the network is not facing a cyber attack, um, then that model is completely trustless. And you can increase the security of that by increasing the number of intermediaries between the first node and the last node. So you could have you know, a seven hop path where you have um, you know, an uh, entry node and then several middle relays and then finally uh, uh, an exit. So I think what's really exciting to us about the Loki project is the civil resistance. That's the thing that really makes mm. it stand out so cool. It's a nice and clever well, mechanism. Well, it's, it's theoretical, of course, um, and it's, Financially based, um, but that, but these decentralized networks so often are. It's just incentives, essentially. Hmm. Well, yeah, incentives and and preventative and mechanisms, but yeah, yeah it, it's not certain to me that it won't be attacked. And there's really, if it is, there's really going to be no way to know either, which is the kind of scary thing about it. Um, and it all depends on whether or not the code base is secure in the first place. A That's lot of a lot of our assumptions yeah. are around. Okay, but this is you know it's going to work and. It's not going to have huge vulnerabilities in it. That this is a funny thing about the whole crypto space. It's mm. all based on like you know there are these people going off in these building these amazing proofs, and it's like yeah okay that's cool, but when you implement this, <laughs> what's the likelihood you're going to leave some accidental backdoor? And it's like well, just like exactly what happened in Zcash. Exactly. Like, yeah. I mean they spent so much time building this really beautiful system like, at the theoretical level, and then the the practical implementation that went down. So yeah. And that's, that's happened with a lot of open source specifications over the years as well. And just like a lot of academic papers come out with these theoretically nice systems, but in practice, like 
my, it's my, usually my preference to rely on cryptography and implementations that, have, that are older or simpler and right. not as exotic yeah. uh, for this exact yeah. reason. You're less likely to run into these major vulnerabilities. Precisely. I think the, the simplest cryptographic systems are typically the best, mm. uh, it just for the sake of like implementation details, you're just less likely to get it wrong. Yeah, it depends. Like, I think um, eventually Loki might be looking at moving to a zero knowledge based really? system. Uh, but not not anytime soon though, just because uh, using zero knowledge proofs at this time is not an order of magnitude improvement on the current system. So the inherent risks that come along with it and the drawbacks of having you know a trusted setup type thing, or yeah, you know, there's various other ways you could cut it. But there, there's uh, there are still major drawbacks, and the improvement isn't huge, so mm -hmm. it's probably not worth it at this time. And also like the the speed. Well, that's right. It's pretty significant. It may, it, and also, how the hell are we going to transition across? It really has to be worth it for us to go from one completely different protocol to another and yeah. be able to support both protocols at the same time so you can bring the old transactions across to the new format and everything else. It's a, it's a, it's going to be quite a mission if we do end up deciding to do that. But the way the research is headed, you know, maybe it will be eventually worthwhile. So we're really interested in zero knowledge uh, as a kind of mechanism for decentralized computation to go with our decentralized web. Mm -hmm. Like we have this problem of, okay, so you can um, get data from the network and you can kind of use it like a sort of document style database uh, for storing you know, tweets or whatever it happens to be, blog posts. Um, but you don't have server side computation at the moment. Right. Uh, so one of the things we've been looking at is, well, can you use you know, zero knowledge as a kind of way of getting that working in a trustless manner? But I think we're least five to ten years away from that actually being workable. Yeah. And even when it is, you know, it's, yeah, it would be interesting. I think we're just going to wait until someone else does this and then we're going to sort of integrate with their network and use it as a backend. Yeah, it's funny. I've been having a few conversations with Key and Tux and mm -hmm. some other of our advisors and we're trying to design um, solutions to certain things like uh, how specifically we're going to do large-scale group messaging and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And um, it's very tempting. Key, Key and Tux, they, they love just hand waving and going, uh, oh yeah, we'll just do a zero knowledge proof to prove that this was done correctly. I'm like, guys, you know how long that's going to take to build and, <laughs> and, and implement? And how that much, it's right. Yeah, I mean, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And how much uh, exposure that gives us to you know various vulnerabilities and, and just knowledge that we don't have. Like, there's very few people on Earth at this time that can actually. Um, understand in depth how that system works and I think it's more about things. the implementation and just getting that right it's like mm. it, it's not even fantastically complex but it is complex you know it's not like the hardest thing it's a couple yeah. of steps back but you know when you're dealing with serious cryptography that's dealing with money like yeah, yeah. You, you have to be a hundred percent sure it works and exactly like the, the zcash incident yeah okay let's move on uh, <laughs> Oh man, we could get into a very lengthy conversation about uh, uh, bloody zero knowledge proofs and all that sort of thing. <laughs> Crypto system designers. All right, here's a good one for you. Uh, why use Arweave over Filecoin or IPFS for anonymous storage gateways on like, you know? So okay. the core thing is that it's permanent and it's fast. So what we find with IPFS is that, that people sort of uh, look at it and they say, yeah, okay, this is pretty cool. And we, we really like the ideals of the project. Um, but in practice, we find that it's, it's just not fast enough to people to really use as a decentralized web. Uh, and it's also very centralized. So typically, as the system exists now with IPFS, um, you have one node that stores all of your data, and then people have to find that node. And if that node goes offline, the likelihood is most of the data that was stored on that node won't be accessible in the network anymore. Um, so as well as being very slow to find, it also just might not be there. You simply right. don't have that problem without it. What about Filecoin? <laughs> so, I mean, Filecoin seems to have pivoted from this system where they were going to be an incentivization layer on top of IPFS um, to something that's actually adjacent to IPFS, a separate storage network. Uh, they recently open sourced their um, repos where they talk about the spec, and, and this is the kind of direction they're moving. There's also lots of interesting things going on with um, having to have watches for your data, essentially. Uh, but yeah, just go, go check out filecoin-specs, I think it's called, on GitHub and have a read. It's pretty interesting. I seem to get the impression you're not overly optimistic about that project. <laughs> not my place to say. 
How political. Okay. Um, any thoughts about archiving data on the Arweave and Pang and Loki? A snap could be created that holds Arweave tokens and provides a conversion service, allowing users to pay in Loki to upload data. That sounds like a great snap, and you should build it. <laughs> Whoever put in that question. <laughs> yeah, I, I think this fits into a broader thing in the utility token market, which would be this kind of um, on-demand swapping between tokens. Mm. That makes a lot of sense. Have you? So um, we're happy to like as long as it you know gets to our tokens at some point, which of course it will have to because it's in the consensus mechanism. Great. The yeah. more the more conversion systems we have, the better. Yeah, I think if Silo does become you know reasonably popular and useful, that's probably something that we'll find a way to integrate. Um, have you thought about payment channels at all? We have, uh, but basically it all comes down to this block weave structure, which is like mm. built to memoize the state, so it's very, very small. And so you can join the network by just downloading like a few blocks and you don't have to have the rest of it. So we don't have this big UTXO tree right. kind of thing going on. Um, so you can still do it, but there's more complexity essentially. It's okay. the same reason that we don't have smart contracts in the system and we're sort of joining with other networks that offer smart contracts instead of tacking them onto our own. Right. And also, I just think the decentralized ecosystem, it's better if we just work with the other's projects that are really good, so we don't have to all do everything. That's no, not going right. to work. Yeah, much better if we all like stick to our own, um, what we're really good at. So for us, it's really storage of data for long periods of time and serving it to web browsers. You guys, it's privacy yeah. yeah. I think um, I think that's a really good point. Uh, you see a lot of projects out there get very tempted to just flail their arms around and do like <laughs> can a do thousand everything. different things. And yeah. we, you know, we're kind of we're kind of guilty of that as well in a lot of ways. Um, but to get the full benefits of each of the things that we're working on, like it, it is kind of necessary to have all these different things. But that's kind of why uh, back to the question before, we really haven't focused on Blink because it sits outside of all of these other features that are interdependent on each other. So we can kind of put it to one side and be like, this is a non-critical feature. We won't work on it for now. Um, uh, it's basically like the old Unix philosophy, if anyone in the decentralization space remembers this kind of thing. We're like, you know, you just you do one thing and you do one thing really well. And then you can chain up all of these things that do one thing and then you get really great stuff out of it. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, the web has been built out of an amalgamation of different technologies. It's unreasonable to expect that any one protocol or spec is going to be, you know, a monopoly on it's also just inefficient in terms of capital yeah totally. like for the for the industry we're all just spending money doing the same thing it's like no come on let's, let's just all just silo off into the single things and then build networks that connect them on the top there yeah okay. however that will take slightly longer so uh, yeah so. i'm somewhat skeptical of um interoperability networks and this sort of thing at the moment mm -hmm. i think it Everything's still far too up in the air for that yeah. to be useful. I don't think we're going to see any adoption of those technologies, to be frank. Yeah, I think it's going to take some time. And you know, there's some big questions like, you know, with our weave, the block time is two minutes, right? So if you want to sync a transaction across a bunch of different networks, and maybe like what they do with Interledger, where you can go through multiple pipes with multiple currencies to get to the, you know, from one currency to an end currency, that's going to take a very long time. Yeah. Uh, so I think there's an awful lot of problems that need to be solved and it's something that's going to come later in the adoption of the ecosystem. Uh, but when it gets there, it's going to be great. And I'm pretty sure it's the way that things are landing. All right, we'll move on to the next question. Is there a possibility for a man in the middle attack if I use Silo? No. That's kind of the point. Not a targeted one. Um, if the Arweave network was entirely compromised somehow. Um, How will the Loki network? Or yeah. the Loki network. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. The, the, see, the nice thing about it is that because you have this anonymization layer through LokiNet and you're randomly selecting an Arweave node, there's no way for a, an attacker to prepare for how you're going to specifically route your connection. So, but also, how would it? I mean, like the data you get back, you can verify was the data you were looking for anyway. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't really see it. I, yeah, I think it's un, unlikely. Um, I think there's just general. Would be the weakest link. I think, yeah, definitely. Where you have to resolve the silo ID, ID down to a transaction ID inside Arweave Weave would be the bit that I would look to attack if I were attempting to attack it. <laughs> Should definitely give away that information. <laughs> However, I do think that it is uh, it is solid. 
Yeah, I think uh, well, onion routing is a very proven process to tunnel through the internet. So mm -hmm. man in the middle attacks already are quite hard to do because you're using an encrypted connection. So you know the more traditional attacks of just sitting somewhere behind a router and watching unencrypted traffic is really not a threat. Um, so yeah, I think there'd have to be some pretty serious vulnerabilities for. Uh, I work. think it would it would have to come through a SHA-256 break. If I were looking to attack it, that's what I'd do. Because, so when you do that query, right, you resolve the um, silo ID down to a transaction ID, and then you can get that transaction ID, and you can verify that the transaction ID has the silo ID you were looking for in the yeah, first right. place. And you can cryptographically verify this whole thing. If I were looking to break it, I would look to break that signature on that transaction and then serve you something more swift. Right. But that requires you to, to break the core um, yeah, RSA 4K. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, theoretically, but in the same way that you could uh, break Bitcoin and so on. Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, and Tor for that matter. And Tor. How does Arweave ensure data is held forever? <laughs> this is really interesting. So we I, I heard, um, sorry, just quickly, I yeah. heard last year uh, shilling your project. <laughs> uh, we were sitting across the table <laughs> from one of, um, of the Arweave investors just before, and um, he was saying that it would be immutable for at least 100 years. I've never heard anyone put a, a, a We date don't put on a it date before. on it. I mean, the thing is with, uh, with storage costs, uh, after a certain period, it becomes negligible. Or at least will do for the next 100 years. That's what we're looking at. So we've looked at the technologies that we think are around 50 years out, and we can see that there's orders of magnitudes of orders of magnitudes, like uh, exponential ones of, um, yeah, room for growth in the storage market. Like when you get down to the uh, base data density, you can get to about 2.5 yottabytes per centimeter cubed <laughs> before you start having problems, which is stands in real contrast to computation, yeah. where we've actually already reached some of those limits in terms of heat density. Like you just can't dissipate the heat. However, back to the, the actual question at hand. So the basic principle is that we put the data into the consensus mechanism. So we have this thing that we call a block weave, and essentially how it works is instead of including the, just the hash of the last block in the production of the next block, we also choose a random old block from the network, and we include the entire contents of that in the production of the next block. What that means is if you're a miner and you have access to that old block, then you can continue with mining. But if you don't, then you just have to sit this round out. So because storage is so much cheaper than hashing, you're incentivized to make a copy of that old data before you optimize your hashing rate. And this means that, yeah, you're essentially offsetting hashing expenditure with storage expenditure. So the more data is stored in the system, the more people compete for storage, and the less they do for wasting electricity. And this just sort of continues over time. Um, and we also have a system where instead of the transaction uh, uh, fee just going straight to the miner, it's put into a pool where it's leaked to the miner over a very long period of time. In fact, actually, indefinitely. We got. 15 decimal places worth of a like, subdivision. So you, that single fee that you put in once, um, yeah, it, it gives, an, uh, gives an output to miners in every block for the next at least 100 years. Right. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Uh, oh, I think we already answered this. How did we meet? How did we meet? We, yeah, we met at this retreat. Uh, yeah. I believe there was, um, <laughs> there was an interesting one. It was sort of a, a meeting of like a lot of the so what happened Good minds was, in this space. yeah. And what then, what happened was, uh, we were at uh, this conference in Berlin called the Zero Knowledge Summit, which is obviously quite oriented around zero knowledge proofs. But there were other conversations happening as well. Uh, this is where I met Tux uh, and quite a few of our investors, and I'm sure the same is applicable to you as well. And um, after I think it was the day after that conference, uh, one of our advisors, One uh, KX, uh, invited us to go out on this retreat. And uh, this retreat was really cool. It was uh, in this like kind of lakeside resort, like about yeah, an hour like out of town, miles out of Berlin, near, near Potsdam. And it was like dead of winter as well, so it was like <laughs> really cold, really cold. Well, for um, you guys, I mean, to us it was well, like, uh, it, well, that you was lived actually, there, so. yeah, it wasn't so bad by that point. No, it was Man, kind of sunny actually, in, like, uh, still it January. was cold. That <laughs> <laughs> was cold. <laughs> um, yeah, so we were at this uh, lakeside resort and um, yeah, essentially it was just like two days of hanging out with some really top-notch uh, investors, projects. Founders. Um, yeah, found, there were lots of founders there. Um, I was there with Key, 
um, we hung out with Sam quite a lot. There was this conversation thing that happened on the last day where I had this uh, now infamous debate with uh, this guy that was working on a supply chain blockchain project. But it's actually name it or? I don't actually remember the name. I do. But okay, let's leave it out. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, no, because I bumped into them at Consensus a couple months later, and, and uh, I get, it wasn't the same guy, but it was one of his colleagues, and he brought it. Oh, you're the Simon from Loki that, that debated the thing. And, um, <laughs> With the whiskey bottle between you yeah, and Yeah, so we had this whiskey bottle that I'd bought from a supermarket down the it's road. really awful whiskey. Yeah, really terrible. terrible. <laughs> it's like 60 euros for the bottle or something. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, so the rules were like whenever. Um, the audience thought that a point that one of us made was really good, <laughs> the other person would have to drink it. This was classic like... Classic debating rules. Cl very, classic very debating normal. rules, yeah. very normal. Uh, <laughs> 10 in the morning as well, I might <laughs> add. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so uh, it was quite funny. Uh, and then the conversation broadened out from there. But um, mm -hmm. no, it was a really good experience. Uh, met a lot of founders and uh, investors. And shortly after that uh, retreat, we actually closed our ICO around that time. So yeah. um, it was definitely, uh, definitely a good experience. And, what I found more interesting than your whiskey debate, no offense, That's was uh, <laughs> it wasn't the day that before we, we had this other debate that was kind of like uh, how we can use blockchain to actually do useful things in society. And at the time, the outcome was pretty pessimistic. Mm. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But now, a year on, I actually think things are moving in that direction way faster than we'd anticipated, which is really good. Yeah, I mean, I think we're starting to see a lot of um, you know, blockchain oriented products actually getting finished and getting released, which yeah. is nice, you yeah. know? Yeah. And now it's gonna be, you know, probably a little while yet while optimization and early user testing happens. And then, you know, if, if you look at the timelines of traditional tech startups and, and new technologies of that sort, like we're, we're, we're expecting too much to happen too quickly. Like it, the internet wasn't built in a day. Yeah, well, this is the thing. They're not just normal startups. It's not like you just take, uh, Twitter in these days, Twitter for cats. Yeah. Okay. And you can crash the thing together in like a weekend of hacking. It's mm. easy. But no. <laughs> yeah. There are some very interesting scalability problems that happen. But broadly it's kind of simpler when the when the model is already there. Yeah. What's happening with all of this decentralization tech is that we're going through the first phases where we have to yeah, essentially go like the internet did from ARPANET to what we now call the internet and then to like web 1.0 and then web 2.0 to get you know, back to where we are, except in this sort of decentralization space. So there's a lot of serious infrastructure that, that has to be built, that we're working on essentially. Um, and yeah, we're starting to see more and more of that stuff actually reach you know, workable products. But of mm. course, after that, there's a kind of time where, where things have to be refined. But now we're slowly, slowly getting to the period where we might actually see adoption of that kind of thing. So I, I think that's really exciting. And it's, and it's faster than we'd anticipated as well, which is great to see. How did you find the conference, Simon? Yeah, I found the conference to be... It's very interesting seeing how it's changed compared mm -hmm. to last year, because I was here this time last year, as I said. And uh, yeah, there's a lot less Russian scammers to begin with. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, you, can't, you can't say yeah, that. Yeah, I'm saying that. There are, <laughs> there are a lot less Russian scammers. I see. I wasn't here it's last year, so I, I have I'm just telling you, that's a fact. Like, no one's going to disagree with that fact. Um, wow, okay. I think the, the space has definitely evolved a fair bit. Mm -hmm. There's a lot less actual projects at this event, which I find interesting. There's a lot of, like, wallets and exchanges and media people and that sort of thing. There's not a whole lot of, you know, actual blockchain projects and there's, like, there's like what Tron with the with the avocado mascot, which is hilarious for a number of reasons. Yep. Um, and who else we got? Who else is here? That's we're here. well, we're here. Yeah, that's a good point. Charlie Lee. Yeah, Charlie here. Charlie Lee's yeah. here from oh, from Litecoin. We saw Vitalik. Last and night. Vitalik was here last night, which was quite cool. Yeah, was it, oh man, it was such a weird. Thing. As soon as uh, Vitalik came out onto the stage to talk, just like. Everyone just went like dead silent and put their smartphones up and just started taking pictures of him. Yeah. And he called it out, it's quite funny, but it was like, ooh, uh, it, it was kind of like he was like a zoo animal for about 10 seconds there. <laughs> did did you feel like that? What, I don't know, I think like it was the typical fame scene, you know, yeah. the person walks down the stage and like that. Yeah, but it wasn't like your normal like, woo, we love you. <laughs> it, was, it was more just like, oh wow, who's they? You know, it was very subdued and very, Quiet. I don't know. I think a lot of people were shocked to see Mr. Buterin for the first time. 
I don't know. In the flesh. In the yeah. flesh. It was an interesting experience. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's actually it's, quite an interesting talk. Yeah, it wasn't bad. He was talking about um, you know, what the Ethereum Foundation is up to, where they are on the upgrade protocol, uh, protocol upgrades, and um, like trying to get feedback from a room of like a thousand people <laughs> on on how they could do things better, which I didn't think was the smartest idea. But there you go. Nice to try at least. Yeah, nice try. Nice try. <laughs> yeah, I think yeah, the stage we're at, we're looking for developers. So mm. uh, yeah, we were at ETH Paris just before this, which was really exciting. We had right. A whole bunch of people uh, building projects on top of our we. Yeah, it turns out like there's this really good use case for, um, you know, if you have a decentralized application that's running on Ethereum, say, uh, and that's supposedly forever, and then you have this web interface that sits on top and it talks to this thing. If you lose the web interface, actually, like, the DAP isn't very useful. Right. So what we're finding is this really good fit. People say, oh, okay, well, I just shoved my, uh, the web UI that goes with my DAP onto Arweave, and now both of them are permanent. Yeah. And it actually gives much better value for it. Mm. So that was something they were looking are you going to come to EdCon in April in Sydney? Um, maybe. I think we're looking at East New York next, right. which is around consensus as well. Okay. And we are actually going to meet up with uh, Rob there, potentially. Right, okay. Yeah. Anyway, in New York? Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. Are you not in on this? No. Okay, right, we'll talk after. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is the first conference we've been to this year. I think the next year to come, based on it. I don't know, everyone seems like quite... All of the people that have run out of money or have got burnt out are not here anymore. So I think at this point, um, the people that are left are still very passionate about cryptocurrencies uh, and blockchain in general. So I think it's become a whole lot more serious. Definitely, right? definitely. It's really good. Like it's matured and evolved, yeah. and I think it's a really good sign for things to come. Um, you know, these things take time, though. So for sure, so. I, I remember like back before this cycle that happened. And the cycle before that, for that matter, it's the same pattern. And yeah, when we get to adoption, I think it's going to be a series of these cycles. So mm. it's it's normal, I guess. However, it is it's nice to see people getting back to like the basics of you know where is the value, how do we make this work for people? Yeah, which is really exciting. Last year, it was it's kind of hard to get through to that core. Sometimes I think there's uh, on the investment side of things anyway. I think there's uh, a much stronger emphasis on how projects are actually going to get users. I think that's something that they want to see a lot more evidence of these days, which is good. Um, so, yeah, I think the, the projects that can actually show that they have something that people will actually use mm -hmm. is of more value than some intricately designed incentive scheme that is a moot point if no one uses it anyway. Yeah, or some bizarre consensus mechanism or some hyper super scaling blockchain yeah. that will never be filled unless they build it really terribly and it's full float like EOS. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> I think one of the most exciting things I've seen this year is like actually some of these incentive mechanisms that people designed are playing out in practice. It's so mm. cool to see. Like um, we saw with Dai the other day, they had this, uh, this jump in, in fees from like 1.5% I forget whether they call it custodian fee or something, a right. management fee, to three and a half percent. This is really interesting. It's like we're actually seeing these voting systems and these incentive mechanisms in the wild and how they actually work. It's yeah. Like, yeah. It's crypto economics for real, not for <laughs> you know, theory. Which yeah. It's really cool to see. I'm excited about like what's going to happen with this. Yeah. Thanks for watching. If you yes. have any questions, you can find us on Discord. We there's the R Wave chat, the Loki chat. Um, find us on, on rweave.org yep. and loki.network so maybe someday we'll make a silo chat a silo chat or well, a silo we'll website gateway oh we could we ah this is an interesting idea could we <laughs> does loki messenger work in such a way that we could stick like a web front end on it and stick that inside silo well loki messenger is, is basically a web front end it's electron uses the Chrome Reddit Yeah, yeah but the messaging in the back end, could we hook into that and then just put like a web UI on it and stick it inside the thing? What? <laughs> okay, so you get the silo web, uh, web application, yeah, yeah. right? The, the represents just like web.telegram.org, right? Uh -huh. And then you just, yeah, you use Loki for the actual distribution of the messages. Yes, in principle. I don't know why you would do that though. Like, I don't know why you'd want to host an instance of Loki Messenger 
outside of its own client implementation because you lose a lot of the security features if it's on, you know, like a web-based implementation because there has to be an element. But yeah, web security is a really interesting topic. But yeah, we yeah. don't have time for it today. No. Anyway, thank you for watching. See you next time.